So in the, in the spirit of surprise, we now have a, an, a surprise insertion into the program. You've heard about calculators and you've heard about information theory. And now we're going to hear uh, Christian Steinrucker, Steinrucken telling us about inverse calculators. It'll be a short talk. So in the spirit of surprise, given that we have um, 10 extra minutes, I'm going to briefly talk about inverting a calculator. This is an idea that um, I've talked about with David a little bit, and it's just a small toy idea. And it's a really silly idea, but I thought I'd present it anyway. So um, the, idea, um, the idea of this work is imagine you have a calculator and you punch in numbers and out comes a number. We're trying to invert that process. So imagine. You instead type in the number, and then the machine tells you what it was that you may have typed. Um, so some of you might recognize this number. Who, who recognizes the number? Great. OK, that's more than half. So there will be 1 over square root 2. Um, and I could have equally said it's sine over pi quarters or any of these other explanations, because quite frankly, there are an infinite possibilities of deriving this number. So that's one of the first difficulties, like how should we even, how should we even approach this problem? Um, what, what's the right answer? How about this number? Anyone know? Okay, great. Um, so it's, it's this. <laughs> and um, the question really is, is it possible to, you know, we could, we could repeat this and um, <laughs> it's, it's, getting, it's getting harder. <laughs> You're getting these as well. <laughs> so, OK, so, so the question really is, is that even possible to do computationally in a sort of smart way, in a fast way, in an elegant way? And, um, the, uh, and the other question is, uh, why would we even need this? Why is this a <laughs> <laughs> other than a b being a fun puzzle, why would this ever be something that, that we care about? So let me first tell you why it's stupid to do this um, and why we, <laughs> why we wouldn't care. So. Um, it is inherently an ill-posed problem because there are infinitely many expressions for any given number, and um, many of them are probably boring. And um, it is not possible to search the space of all mathematical expressions um, efficiently, and the true answer could be arbitrarily complex. So um, it's maybe ill-defined, but, um, uh, but there are actually reasons why I care. So here's, here's my story of why I care. I have been working on uh, compression codes for a bit. Um, and at one point, I was reverse engineering a closed source compression algorithm. And the only thing it would give me were log p's. So I had an executable Linux binary. And I could run it. And I could give it an input sequence. And for this input sequence, I would get a series of log probabilities. But of course, um, to try and reverse engineer what the algorithm is doing from the log probabilities is a bit challenging, to put it mildly, because that's what it looks like. Um, it, it's essentially, can you all see this? It's, it's a bunch of numbers like this. And um, it's kind of hard to see uh, what such an algorithm would be doing. Of course, here in this case, I know the algorithm. This is LZW. And, um, and these are the log p's it would produce. Now, if I run it through my inverse calculator, I would get something like this. So it tells me a story that is much more, um, much more intelligible because it shows that um, the very first symbol that it compresses makes a choice between 257 things. Um, that's 256 possible symbols plus an end of file marker. So that's kind of understandable. Um, then the next one, it makes a choice between 258 things. That's because it's just added something to its, di to its dictionary, namely the T. And given that it's tea time, that's probably a good thing to add. Then later on, it sort of subtracts a bit and adds a bit. That's because it has a partial match in what's already in its dictionary. And that sort of story is much easier to reverse engineer than, say, this bunch of numbers here, right? So 
Here is an example of a compressor where I'm not telling you what it is, and that is actually very close to what I tried to reverse engineer. And um, it is actually much easier to look at this when I have um, when I have these sorts of explanations on the side. You might notice that in comparison to the dictionary coder, this one makes choices that sort of go down. So I, I'm choosing between um, 257 symbols at, at first, and then it's sort of slowly decreasing. That's because um, it's a different sort of algorithm. It's a PPM-like algorithm um, that has a rule that excludes symbols that it has already seen. So um, it's sort of possible to extract a story uh, from, from that kind of thing. Now, here's an example of running this inverse calculator, um, which is a nice little tool, and you simply type in the number, and within a second or so, you get an answer on the screen that looks like this. It also tells you nearby matches, which means that um, you can sort of see um, the near misses of things that it, con hypotheses it considered but discarded. Here's another example. This is pi squared over six. And a curious thing you might see here is um, that it sort of appears twice, right? So there's pi times pi over six and pi squared over six. And that's simply an artifact of the fact that IEEE floating point um, really cares about in which order you do your operations. And in some cases, it gives you slightly different results. That's why there are two different entries for, for these things. Um, Here's another example. So um, it detects that it's half of the golden ratio. Incidentally, it's also able to reverse engineer the golden ratio from scratch quite easily. And um, even numbers that are similar, so this one, for example, looks sort of like the golden ratio, just with different integers. Um, it, gets it, uh, it gets it quite easily. So this is fun. Um, and. Uh, how, uh, oh yeah, it, it also sometimes tells you quite, quite interesting alternative hypotheses of how you might have gotten your number, which is also an added bonus. So how does it work? Um, essentially, there are three key ingredients to this calculator. One is you need a data structure that allows you to efficiently search through a space of numbers. So um, in, this, in this prototype, I've used a tree map, which means that you can search through a tree, which gives you a very efficient lookup, but you can also go back up in the tree and sort of search things that are nearby. This gives you this nifty little table at the end, which shows you the neighborhood of, of what's around. And this data structure is then seeded um, with constants such as e and pi, a bunch of integers and other interesting numbers. The second ingredient is a symbolic algebra engine. So you're going to need something that can represent symbolically an expression such as log of something or um, square root of something. The reason for that is that we want to be able to do something like basic algebraic simplification because we probably don't want to evaluate things that add one and subtract one all the time. We want to eliminate as much as possible of the search space so that we don't um, waste time evaluating. And um, we also want string conversion and um, uh, a bunch of other things, and of course, evaluation. We want to say, what does this particular expression evaluate to? And we get a floating point number out. Then, but the really smart thing, um, this is sort of the solution to the puzzle, is the inverse computation engine. And the way that works is that we have a query, we want to search what the number is, we have this really sparse database with not much in it. Most likely, our answer is not going to be in it, but we're going to search anyway. So we search the database, and um, we're going to find things that are nearby. But here's how we can improve our search. So if, for example, say, um, we know that our query is the square root of a number, then we could square the query and look that up instead. And if that gives us a hit, and that might be pi, for example, then we take that result, take the square root, and see if it matches. And anything that we encounter on the way, we insert into this searchable database. So we can very, very quickly test a bunch of hypotheses and populate things that are nearby. So we have essentially a tree search that searches through possibilities of what it might be. That might be, could it be a logarithm? Could it be a square root? Could it be um, a sine or a cosine? And we try to invert that computation and then search specifically for what the inverse would be. And uh, this, is how, this is how we can get answers. Of course, even with that, 
uh, we still have a problem because essentially um, this algorithm will fail at doing things like computing the su finding the sum of three complicated expressions. That's simply because as you add terms to the sum, um, your uh, search strategy becomes uh, worse than cubic when you have three things, so it just, it just gets really bad. Um, but I told you it was a stupid thing to do, so you can't hold me accountable. <laughs> Um, so we work backwards, and this is how, um, how we can build a very simple, fun tool like that. Um, so I'll end there, but I'll say why we might care about this. And one reason, sort of, in a very general sense, is that inverting a computation, um, or in, gen in general, inverting a computer program, um, is actually the solution to hard AI. We already know that's impossible, um, we cannot generally invert computer programs, but maybe if we find some interesting spaces where we can put priors on programs um, and where we can do inference in, once we find, hopefully, find these things, um, we might have some very powerful tools at hand, and this is just a sort of proof of concept thing. Thank you very much. Time for one quick question, maybe. <laughs> okay, question. Uh, very interesting. There is uh, one algorithm that you can use for at least for algebraic numbers, which is the lattice basis reduction. So if you have a, an approximation of an algebraic number and sort of a guess of what its degree is, you can just use lattice basis and then it finds you the minimal polynomial, which is so maybe that you can add to this. Great, <laughs> thank you. Okay, um, yeah, is there a question? This reminds me of the inverse symbolic calculator. Have you compared how it performs wi uh, with that? And also, how did you get e to the pi minus pi to the e if you don't, uh, if you're only adding in, say, one layer of logarithms or exponentiation? How do you get two complex expressions and then take the difference? Ah, so there's a bunch of expressions that it's seeded with. It's not only pi and e, but also um, it searches up to um, a depth that's not entirely determined by the number of operations, but by a complexity score that's sort of roughly my prior of how likely it is that you might do something. Um, the, the actual prototype also includes ways of, for example, um, calculating, reversing some infinite sums and some other fancy things that, that were easy to put in. But in general, it's of course impossible. Oh yeah, the inverse symbolic calculator. I've heard of it. I haven't seen a working prototype of it online recently, sadly. Um, neither my calculator isn't online either, so I can't complain really. Um, but also, I can't compare. <laughs> okay, I think we'll um, let's thank Christian again.